Okay. Um, I'm Andy Warfield. Um, I'm the CTO and one of the founders at uh, Coho Data. And this is the third of four presentations at SFD Sourcefield 8. Um, and this one is about understanding workloads and some of the work that, that we at Coho have done uh, to do that inside the product. And so I've called it workload numerology. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to poke a little bit of fun at the fact that, that everybody claims to do some amount of this. Um, but it's, it's not just a matter of, of speeds and feeds, as so many things are often perceived to be in storage. Um, and so, as I told you before, I'm going to try and start with, with trying to emphasize an important aspect of our design. Um, so this is an interesting part of our architecture, and it's the one that I was just talking about at the end of the, of the last section. Right? We manage the placement of both data and connections very explicitly. Right? That's the thing that makes Coho's architecture unique <coughs> as a storage system. That we have this dynamism of placing both the access into the storage and the data that's being accessed. Um, and the little twist that I'm going to put there is that we're able to increasingly do that based on a fairly detailed analysis of the workloads themselves in the system. And this is something that has been a significant investment over time and that is going to continue to take time to build, right? That, that doing this kind of like data science style analysis of workloads to make safe, dynamic decisions isn't something that you go and do in a few months, right, of implementing. It's not like dedupe or, or things like that. It's actually like a fair bit of analysis. And we're learning a ton of stuff doing this. And I'm going to try and teach you some of the things that, that we've learned. Um, you know, so we use the, the controller to do that. There's two components in the system that are interesting here. One is this thing that we call flash fit, which is the bit of this that does the placement, right? It manages tiering and placement inside the cluster. And then the other bit of that is, is the system that we call on stream, um, which, uh, if enabled, feeds data back to uh, a central service that Coho runs uh, that monitors the, the sort of liveness of our systems and also collects data on the workloads that they're running to better tune, uh, to, to get great performance for those workloads. Um, the way that I would characterize this section of the talk uh, is to emphasize that in traditional storage systems, we've really worried a lot about durability and getting high performance off of crappy hardware, <laughs> right? It's an aggregation problem, right? You have all these like crappy, unreliable disks. You have to come up with ways to make them more reliable and perform better than they do, right? A given disk is 100 IOPS, right? So you need a lot of them to get to the point of even a medium class flash device. The second point here, I think, is a little bit more uh, carefully made, which is that as these storage systems have gotten faster and faster and faster, storage itself has, not, or has become a connectivity problem. Right, and locality problem rather than a durability problem. Right? So for all the reasons that I just told you about in the last slide, the better we can do with managing connectivity to these devices and the placement of data, the better the system will behave. Right? And remember, because those PCIe devices or non-volatile DIMMs are effectively diamonds, right? they're indivisible, right? I need to find ways to, to manage data on top of them. OK, so let me show you a quick demo of the on-stream. And so this is. Um, one of our customer sites in uh, OnStream. So I'm just going to flip through this quickly and hope yeah, that my customer's name this as is a partner, right. would I have access to my customer's portal? That is something that is actually coming. You already get a little bit of it, not this much. Okay. But um, it's something that we're looking at exposing to, uh, to partners, absolutely. <coughs> and so um, this site is relatively uh, unloaded. They were doing a bunch of like large volume write testing earlier. Uh, but you know, you see, it's, uh, this is a POC box that I grabbed. It's, uh, you know, they've got 127 VMs and, you know, a bunch of throughput going on on the system, right? So the idea with this, and I can zoom this into arbitrary historical ranges um, and look at the behavior over time, right? The idea with that system is it is all of the speeds and feeds stuff, right? We can see the version of every system that's installed. We can see the state of upgrades. We can see any performance events the customers get. One thing that I thought, I think I mentioned this last year, I thought this was going to be super creepy, but we adopted as a sort of support uh, doctrine that when we got cable pulls, we would phone the customer, right? At least the first time. And it uh, turns out that people really like this, right? That, that you call them when a cable's been pulled, right? Either they did it on purpose and they like knowing that you're there, or they didn't do it on purpose and they're like, whoa, my phone's about to start ringing. <laughs> thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for giving me the heads up, right? And with redundant links, you know, you're, you're still now losing service. And so you know, it's a valuable bit of information. Um, this dashboard is actually just a view on a bunch of, 
of data that we feed back. And so what we actually do, and I, I think that, I, I don't need to go into a ton of detail of this because I think that this is probably how most storage companies that are implementing this kind of uh, analytics backhaul do things. But basically, the boxes in the field, right, have uh, uh, negotiated up front uh, a secure channel with Coho. Uh, and they encrypt all of this data and they feed it into a public cloud environment, right? Currently AWS. They post to S3 encrypted bundles, right, of the stuff that they have. And so that is a highly available and scalable, right, accessible service that we can stage this data in, encrypt it. And then we actually pull that data down into our site, right? It's How it's much data being driven per system, would you say, on a daily um, basis? The, the, for a high load system, it's in the tens or hundreds of kilobytes per second, uh, per minute. Per second? No, per minute. Um, it's fairly low rate data. Um, that's for high load. Um, in aggregate across all of our installs, I think that we are, we're certainly in the low hundreds of terabytes <coughs> of this data at this point, uh, possibly approaching petabytes of archival performance data. And that'll be cool to you when I tell you about some of the stuff that's actually in it, um, in terms of, of characterizations. Now, um, to, to explain the rest of this, I have to like make you hurt a little bit. Um, <laughs> so bear with me. This is the bit that I think Ray always likes. Um, <laughs> and so uh, um, I don't know what that says about Ray. Um, anyways, the, the, the thing that, so, when everybody talks about these phone home things, they go, oh, we've got a billion data points inside the system. We collect billions of stuff per second, and we know IOPS and latency and all this stuff. And I don't know exactly what the purpose of that is, right, other than to, like, you know, Based build that dashboard system, that, I, yeah. that I show you. Like, the, yes, it's, it's interesting to see the health of the system, and maybe there's some stuff you can do around analyzing anomalies, but for most of the things that I've looked at, there are sort of follow-on questions that guide the data that you collect. And so it's not necessarily the right thing to always just collect everything, right? One of the things that we couldn't collect, right, reasonably for both privacy reasons and for sheer data volume reasons is a stream of the offset and size of every single request, right, that the system makes. If you had that, yeah, you could I do, do some do, pretty cool content stuff. Too, and you definitely oh, well, yeah, and, then, and also, by the way, a hash of the data that's being, yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome. Because we're mixing all of the types of storage that I told you about before, right, it's actually really, really valuable to understand the working set. Right, working set is one thing that is becoming really, really important in these systems. And most people, myself included, a few years ago, had absolutely no insight into what working set style properties look like of these systems. And so the working set, just to be clear that, that we all know what we're talking about here, is the recently accessed chunk of data, right? So you create your VMDK VMs or OpenStack VMs with like 10 gig sparse disks or 50 gig sparse disks. You put a system on it that's maybe like three gigs of data, and then you access, what do you think? Right, steady state. Mm, 400 meg. Right, yeah, that's actually a pretty good guess, right? So low hundreds of meg, right, steady state. Um, it varies massively between systems, but the more insight you have into that, the better job you can do of placement. But backhauling that data is a super big pain. And so here's the head twisting part, because I'm going to try and explain to you at a really high level how this works. The easiest way for me to explain this, so there's, the, imagine you have this box, okay, so. You need the black pen, you're drawing a black box. I'm going to draw a black box. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are these things that have become really interesting in computer science recently called hyperlog logs. They sound really, really technical. What a hyperlog log does, it's a black box. It's a small data structure, right? Like it's, you know, bytes to kilobytes in size. And you can put things into it, right? And the things that I'm going to put into this are addresses. the addresses of data that I access in the storage system. And the HLL, the hyperlog log, can only answer one question, right? It can't tell you if it has seen a given address before. It can only tell you about how many addresses it has seen, right? It can tell you the cardinality of unique things, right? So I can, ins I can insert the same address into this. If I'm accessing just one block on storage, right, till the end of the day, and it's going to basically give me a one, right, plus or minus. 
I can put in you know, five gig of unique addresses and it'll come back and say five gig. I can put in 10 gig, of, so it, it sizes that, right? So it is a way of characterizing a set of uniqueness. The problem is, is it's additive over time, right? So it just you know, counts the number of unique things that you need. And so this ended up being the starting point for, for these two tricks that end up being pretty useful. The first trick was we built a row of these things. So we call these counter stacks, right? And so what you do is over time, right? It's the beginning of the day. I create one of these HLLs and I start jamming addresses into it as they're accessed and it realizes that over the amount of time that it's been used, the working set size, right, the amount of data that's been accessed is around, let's say, one gig. And at some time in the future, let's say an hour later or hundreds of thousands of requests later, I'm going to create a newer one. This one gets all the new requests, but the new requests also go to the old one. So I'm going to insert them into so all So I can do a sliding time window. In the vector, right? And so now I access 100 meg here, but this one doesn't change, right? So I know deductively that this working set was included in this one, right? Weirdly, a little bit later, I stick in a new one and access, right, 2 gig. And this one goes to 2.1, and this one goes to 3. Right? It's all new. Right? So that gives me a sense of the working set over time, but I'm still stuck with the fact that these things are additive. I've lost the fact that this one had 100. So the only other tweak we do is these things are small enough that I can actually snapshot them. Right? So I periodically, as I add new ones, snapshot copies of the old versions of them. Right? And that means that I can pick any window in time, and I can study the working set as it evolved over that window in time. Right? This is kind of a cool cool trick. And these things are small enough that you can store them on a per object basis and you can ship them home. And how frequently are you creating them? Uh, we create them all the time. Uh, well, it's like, I mean, what's the granularity? The granularity in today's system is at a VMDK level. Well, not a time granularity. Um, at the VMDK level? Yep. You understand the working side at the VMDK level? At, at the VMDK level at a 4K resolution. Oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, you know what the application is? That's running on IBM? So I believe we haven't done this in tons of detail, so there, there are two answers. One is, in some cases, we've asked the customers to share the VMDK names with us so that we can correlate, and that ends up being really neat. Splunk looks super cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, it tells a story. Because um, I mean, I've had a problem over the past year or so where people keep saying working set and not defining a time period, and the backup guy's working set of all the files that were touched today and the storage systems working set of all the data that was touched in the last hour are very different. Yes, yes. So to answer that question, I believe the current policy is we create these something like every, like, I, I want to say 10,000, but it might be 1,000 requests okay. or based on a periodic timer. Okay. Right? So if the system's basically idle for an hour, we'll create one anyway so that we can delineate the time. Right. Right, so it's both both things trigger it. So it's so a snapshot level, or is that the the hyperlog log level? Which one? The hyperlog log level. Yeah. Okay, so every every thousand requests, you're generating a new hyperlog yeah. log yeah. and yeah. accumulating the information. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And if, and if time goes by with less than a thousand requests, I don't care. Exactly. Well, we take one anyway just to know that it's yeah, but it's just such yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just such a low level that. And so, so this allows me to generate. You can draw these other way, but this is a miss ratio curve. I prefer to draw these as hit ratio curves, right? And basically, the thing that you get is you can model if you had an LRU, right? Uh, LRU cache replacement, least recently used. As I add cache from zero to one terabyte, right? As I put more and more of this thing in flash, this is how well the hit rate would do on that flash. On that and so in that in that small working set example of like 400 meg, right? You get a graph that looks like this, right? Right? Because at 400 meg, everything's in flash, right? In a random I/O workload, you get a graph that looks like this. And in some things like Splunk, where it has a big chunk of data that it's like sequentially accessing and stuff, you get things that look like this, right? Because it's got like sort of ingest and access periods. So, uh, so the working set uh, will be getting refreshed uh, in an hourly basis or in few minutes basis for per VMDK. That's the information on it gets reset basically on uh, on the granularity of the of the yeah. stack cycling. Yeah. These all are system defined, or uh, customers having the option for? We set them internally. Okay. Right. Um, the way that these are exposed yeah, the currently to customers. The problem is, is I want all of this to run on a span port so then I can decide what storage to buy, not. I would love to do that as well. Um, I would love to get 
access to that. VMware doesn't expose those, but one of the things we really wanted to do was to. Oh, I'll set up the switches to set to, the samples. to give you so. no. To yeah, just so to if you want to do it off a of mirror to port, mirror port, a, yeah, we can set something like that for sure. Because as a you know, in my consulting days, to be able to you know exactly. bring up a two U appliance in, stick it in a data center, yep. leave it there for a week, come back and be able to go. You need exactly one point two terabytes of flash. Absolutely. Yep, would be way cool. Yep. Nice. So you said me, VMDK granularity. Did you really mean any file yeah, on it? I, so I mean, right now we've because the primary uh, customer use case for us is virtualization. Uh, we've set it up at a at a like VM disk okay. granularity. Um, you can actually apply it. You basically turn it on on an entity of the data path. So you, we can do it at a file level. We can do it at a connection level okay. or a mount point level. And so we'll look at all those things. Considering <coughs> VMware stock drop, looking at other <laughs> alternatives um, with this. Well, they do support Zen. So, yes. so, <laughs> so let me let me show you another couple of really. I, I want to get through this section because I want to talk about the Docker stuff, and I only have half an hour left with you guys. So I'm just going to breeze through a few things really quickly. These are applications of counter stacks, right? Here's one system. This is actually like a production machine that we use in in the development team that has 50 terabytes of data and does lots of like build type jobs. And all of this blue data, right, based on looking at the counter stacks, even though there's tons of data stored on it, hasn't been accessed for more than a month, right? The access to data in the system is is very small. Not all systems look as beautifully like <laughs> isolated. <laughs> Some of them as, as beautifully underutilized as exactly. this. Yes. But this is the strongest kind of case that I can make to you for mixed media storage, right? No amount of data reduction over here makes this a good value proposition, right? So, anyway, um, I'll show you one other little thing in the web browser quickly, um, which is a tool that one of the guys built recently, this is the thing I was mentioning to you, Howard, that on that system, right, this is all the unused space, and these are the working sets um, of data accessed over this period of time for each VM. Wow. And so inside here, this is my biggest footprint VM. This one in the last month has accessed 1.9 terabytes of data. It's ever accessed 14.5 terabytes, and its disk is 50 terabytes. But right? last week if it was I only 91 gigs. If I shrink this to the last gig. week, it's tiny, right, and so on. And so this is just a way, and the, the thing that we've been playing with, and this is really, really early, is based on the characterization of this workload, right, we've got a little tool to, oops, <laughs> oh no. Live demo. Ah, oh, shoot. Things happen. happened. Oh, I bet, my, I bet my web server has possibly crashed. Well, I'll bring it up and show it to you afterwards. I can download a FIO workload, like config, that sets up a Pareto workload with the parameters tuned to this, right? So it's a first step toward you trying to synthesize this, to this workload. workload. Right, to be able to read <coughs> it. So in time, you, you, you will be able to compare different workloads, different virtual machine, and say, this virtual machine is not working very exactly. well. So, so what I want to be able to do is go, this is a suite of workloads that's representative of our customers. Let's use it in test. Or this combination of workloads really made the system do something weird. Let's repeat that in test. Right, those types of things. And so, so that's, yeah. This tool is available to customers, or is no? This is an internal thing. In a lot of these cases, we're at the stage where we absolutely use these with customers in terms of a support engagement. In fact, there's an example of that uh, right here. This was a customer support interaction. We have this really, really spectacular customer who's been with us since the beginning and has uh, has suffered through all of you know all of those file system updates and, and versions of things right there. For the most part, very non-disruptive. But uh, he's been with us you know for a long time, and uh, he was getting to the point where he was tearing. And so we did this analysis of his environment, and this is the breakdown of the working sets of all of the VMs in his environment. Right, the bulk of them are in the tens of megs but a bunch of them are in the 150 gigs or higher. And so one of the things that came out of this was we gave them the list of big VMs, and you know, one example was there was one of those that had a disk that appeared to have nothing on it, wasn't even formatted. And the, uh, the backup tool that was set to point at it couldn't do differentials on the file system because it assumed that it didn't know what it was, and so it was periodically scanning the whole disk and hammering the, the system. Right? The other thing we were able to do was this was the working set in aggregate of the system Right? And we were able to model, if he turned off all those Bigfoot VMs, what the working set would look like. So there's some really cool planning tools falling out of this. At the moment, it's more of a sort of managed kind of like support engagement, but we're progressively pulling it into product. 
Um, I'm not going to do this. I was going to tell you about how we can use these things to do prefetching. I'll leave that as an exercise to the, uh, to the audience. Uh, and I'm not going to do this because this will really uh, hurt you lots. Um, so let me just summarize those points quickly. Um, so collecting a continuous stream of IOPS and latency numbers, uh, even millions and millions of them, is, is interesting but not possibly actionable. Right? The, the, you know, one of the things that we really focused on doing was bringing in some expertise in data analysis and trying to come up with approaches that let us do meaningful things with the customer data and the workload data that we had. Um, though we've actually made some pretty interesting, like actually scientific, we've published some of these results, uh, developments in terms of how to characterize these, and we're really starting to fold them into how we do automated placement in the system today. Um, and so that's where that stands. Okay, and so that's the end of that one, and I've got 24 minutes before you guys all break for the door to, uh, <laughs> to go through the Docker one. Um, this one is much less painful than the, uh, than the last two in terms of technical gore. Um, so any questions before I start this, or should I just... How much data can the customer pull from the unit to load into their own analytics and environment? Um, all of the log data that we have is accessible over REST, and any of the on-stream stuff that isn't there, we would be completely happy providing them access to. And so if people wanted it, mm -hmm. they could absolutely get it. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the this this is a good beer conversation. But one of the one of the things I've always struggled with is not putting in too many knobs, mm -hmm. and so we're collecting all this stuff. But as soon as we commit to like showing them something in the UI, you know, we're kind of committing to it for a long time. And so yeah. we're always trying to. So we expose a ton of stuff over the REST API, and we're cautious about <laughs> what we expose at a higher level. Um,